Virtually every pseudoscientific claim credits some form of energy. Life force, chi, negative energy, positive energy, the body's energy fields, all meaningless nonsense, which sound plausible simply because they throw in a scientific sounding word, energy. New Age practitioners seem to think that energy is a hovering, glowing cloud that can go wherever it's needed and from which adepts can draw power and feel rejuvenated or accomplish healings. Imagine a vaporous creature from the original Star Trek series and you have a good idea of what New Agers think energy is. Energy is a measurement of something's ability to perform work. Given this context, when spiritualists talk about your body's energy fields, they're really saying nothing that's even remotely meaningful. Here's a good test. When you hear the word energy used in a spiritual or paranormal sense, substitute the phrase measurable work capability. Does the usage still make sense? There's a good reason you don't hear medical doctors or pharmacists talking about energy fields. It's meaningless. This is usually a really frail excuse for why mainstream scientists don't take their claim seriously, why the product is not approved by the FDA, or why scientific journals won't publish their articles. You'll often hear this in the form of a conspiracy of the medical establishment to suppress a quack cure because it's in the interest of the medical industry to keep you sick. In fact, any doctor or pharmaceutical company that could develop a new cure would make a fortune. They'd never suppress it. The same goes for auto manufacturers worldwide who are said to be suppressing new efficient engine technologies. As much as some people with particular ideological agendas would like you to believe it, science never suppresses good science. As we've seen time and time again, by no definition can all natural mean that a product is safe or healthy. I'm standing next to a gigantic stand of poison oak. Consider other all-natural compounds like hemlock, mercury, lead, toadstools, box jellyfish neurotoxin, asbestos, not to mention a nearly infinite number of toxic bacteria and viruses, E. coli, salmonella, bubonic plague, smallpox. For those natural compounds that are not harmful, synthetic versions have been engineered in many cases to make them even safer, more effective, or able to be produced in large quantities. All natural? Often that's a great thing. Just as often, it's not. Some claimants suggest that it's moral, ethical, or politically correct to accept their claims, to redirect your attention from the fact that they may not be scientifically sound. In some cases, such as the anti-vaccine or anti-fluoridation activists, proponents try to use the court system to force their beliefs to be adopted in place of what we've learned through science. Generally, when a theory is scientifically sound, even if it's brand new, it will eventually find its way into the educational curriculum. Good science is done in the lab, not in the courts, not in protest marches, not in blogs, and not on Oprah. A political or cultural campaign to legalize or promote some product or claim is a major indicator that it's bogus. When you learn to identify these warning signs, and many others like them, this list is certainly not complete, you'll find that you start seeing them everywhere. And if you're having a conversation with someone who's trying to convince you to try some herbal therapy or new age meditation, you can point out these fallacies in their arguments and it strips them of the tools they depend on the most. Now that we understand what to look for, let's try applying these skills to some actual claims out there. But keep in mind that critical thinking must not be just about debunking. There's no benefit in debunking for its own sake. Rather, debunking is only necessary when pseudoscience stands in the way of progress. And then, it's critical. Precognition is where you dream or imagine or foresee some event that later comes true when there's no possible way you could have known about it. One of the stories of precognition you hear most often is of someone thinking or dreaming about another person only to find later that that person died at that same moment. 
it sounds like proof positive that there must have been some psychic connection. French physicists Georges Charpak and Henri Broche made a neat calculation to show that this is not only possible, it's inevitable. On average, it should happen to about one in every 150 people sometime in their lifetime. Assume that everyone knows about 10 people who die each year, either family, acquaintances, or mostly celebrities and famous people, people who might pop into your thoughts no more than once a year. There are 105,120 five-minute intervals in a year in which each of those 10 people might die. That gives a 1 in 10,512 chance that you'll think about someone during the exact same five-minute interval in which they happen to die in any given year. That doesn't sound very probable by itself, but consider that there are 300 million people in the United States. This improbable coincidence must happen to about 28,500 Americans every year. Only a tiny percentage of those get their stories on television or in print, but it's enough to convince an uncritical layperson that precognition and psychic connections must be real. And when you relax the criteria even slightly, you think or dream about someone, then next time you talk to them you find that something unpleasant has happened in their life, the probability goes up exponentially by a factor of millions. The mathematics behind this concept universally apply to all pseudosciences that depend on extraordinary coincidences for their support. The law of large numbers, the inevitability of improbable events, proves that the most bizarre coincidences are merely mathematical certainties. Understand the math. Don't turn first to paranormal explanations. Next, let's consider complementary and alternative medicine. You'd think that with a century of modern medical science behind us, people would not still be looking to the ancient state of knowledge when it comes to their health. But, unfortunately, it seems that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Just a tiny sampling of products and techniques still being sold, still in demand among 21st century Americans, and with no empirical or plausible hypothetical foundations. Reflexology, homeopathy, ionized jewelry, magnet therapy, therapeutic touch, colonic irrigation, chiropractic, herbal detoxification, vitamin megadosing, psychic healing, new age blessings, detoxifying foot pads and foot baths, naturopathy, aromatherapy, bioidentical vitamin therapy, relation, relation, psychic healing, You'll notice that these products are not FDA approved. It's legal to sell anything you want that's not overtly dangerous, so long as you don't claim that it is intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or illness. And that's how billions of dollars of worthless supplements are sold every year. <laughs> 